Lon Seidman, and we've got another interview today, but this one is really special because it's with Tom Kalinske, who is the CEO of Sega during the 90s, and he's really the guy who turned that console over there, the Sega Genesis, uh, into the market leader that it became to be. It was really unexpected. Uh, Nintendo was really, really dominant in the video game industry at the point that the, the Genesis came out. Uh, and he was able, along with his team, to uh, build a marketing program, a very aggressive marketing program that uh, brought Sega out of obscurity and into the mainstream with Sonic the Hedgehog kind of leading the way. He's the guy that really helped pull all of this together. So we'll talk about uh, really the rise of Sega and also the fall of Sega because as quickly as they uh, came into the scene and built tremendous amounts of market share in the 16-bit era, uh, once those 32-bit consoles came out, uh, Sega faded very quickly. And he'll talk about uh, some of the things that happened with the company there. We'll also talk to him about um, some of the advances in educational technology because that is also a real passion of his. So this is an audio-only interview uh, because it was logistically, it just worked out better to do audio. So you can listen to it on YouTube, of course. But if you want to uh, subscribe to my podcast, which you can find on iTunes and all the other uh, podcatchers out there, uh, you can listen to it on your mobile device. You can also go to lon.tv slash Stitcher and listen to it with the Stitcher app as well. And you could subscribe to me on those two platforms and get every long form interview that I do in audio form uh, on those two platforms as well. So let's uh, listen to that interview with Tom Kalinske. So, Tom, first of all, thank you for, for joining the show, and uh, we appreciate it. This is the, the, the 25th anniversary of the Sega Genesis release, and it, and it doesn't seem like it's been that long ago, does it? It sure doesn't feel that long ago to me. Uh, it feels like it was just a few days ago that we did all this. And it was, it was quite a story. So, so just to recap, and I, I, people really should read the book Console Wars, and if, and if they're not into reading, there's going to be a documentary, too, coming, coming up as well. But um, Hayu Nak Nakayama, who was, I guess he was the, the head of Sega. Was he the president of Sega? He was the CEO of Sega Inc. So over both Sega of America and Sega Europe and Sega Japan and then some studios that were under the corporation. Now, he, he finds you in Maui, right? After you were taking a break uh, after leaving, uh, was it Mattel you were at? Um, and he finds you on the beach, right? Yeah, I was on a I was on a vacation with my wife at the time. We had two daughters. We've since had uh, more children, so we had five together. And uh, he tracked me down. He called my assistant back here in California and said, "Where's Tom?" And she said she made the mistake of saying, "Well, he's he's in he's in Maui at the, I think it was the Waikolo or something." And and he tracked me down on the beach. That must have freaked you out because back then it was it was not easy to find people, was it? Well, no, especially when he flies from Japan to, um, to Maui to find me. And, uh, you know, I'm literally lying on the beach with my wife and daughters, and this shadow comes over me, and I look up, and it's Nakayama-san, who I knew, by the way, from when I was at Mattel. He was uh, then a vice president of marketing at Sega, and uh, Sega was owned by Paramount Pictures and reported to Mike Eisner and Barry Diller at the time. And so he, when he came to town, we'd have licensing meetings sometimes, and I would, I would go to those meetings to find out what, the, what they were up to and, and of course see also if we could license any of our Mattel characters to them. So I've known him for, I knew him for years, and then here all of a sudden he, uh, he's CEO and uh, tracks me down. And so you get on a plane from Maui, right? So you, you, your, your family was, is probably um, you know, destined for sainthood here. <laughs> um, you, you get on a plane and you go to Tokyo. Uh, what did you see there um, that, that made you want to go back into the business and, and try to help Sega? Yeah, sure. Well, and, and by the way, up to this point, you know, I was obviously at Mattel. And I knew about in, tele, in television, and, and so I'd seen that type of video game. I certainly had seen... Atari, and I'd seen ColecoVision, I'd seen Nintendo 8-bit, and I'd seen Sega Master System. So I was, you know, aware of what video games looked like and, and how they played, and I was just blown away by 16-bit by Genesis. I thought it was truly a, a dramatic step forward. And then he showed me this handheld uh, device that later became Game Gear, and it was a color screen versus a black and white Nintendo screen. And so it was the combination of those two things that made me think, wow, this is a company that really has some interesting technology that consumers are going to love, and, and that's what got me interested in it. And were you fascinated, too, being, a, being someone who was in the toy industry and very experienced in the toy industry, that you know, these products were really the, the first time that you could get teenagers into toy stores, right? 
Well, it, yeah, it, you know, the there's always been this issue in the toy industry of the ever shrinking market because kids stop playing with toys at a younger and younger age. And it was certainly true back then. It's still true today and maybe even emphasized today with all of the tablets out there. So so this was revolutionary to me, and uh, I was very interested in, uh, in, in doing something with it. But at the same time, I was kind of reluctant because I'd heard how Japanese companies uh, – ran the show and didn't let the Americans make their own decisions. And I was very worried about that. And so I got, I extracted a promise later in our discussions. It didn't happen all in one day. Later in our discussions, I extracted this promise from Nakayama-san that I would be able to make the decisions for the United States and for a lot of the products that were going into Europe. And that was a big concession on their part to, to kind of give you some free reign to do that, right? Uh, apparently huge. Yeah, right. As you found out later. Now you um, now you get you get to Sega, and you know it's kind of like I guess the bad news bears to some degree, right? They they've got all this great potential, and it's un, unmatched. You know what I was interested in in reading the book is that you, you really didn't clean house. You know, usually when they bring in a new CEO to try to revive a brand, you know, there's a lot of um, you know kind of scorched earth of of you know getting rid of people and 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 trying to bring in your own people. You you really didn't do that, did you? Not too much, no. And in fact, part of that, and I'm not sure how well this was described in the book, but you know, I had known Mike Katz, who was then president of Sega of America, for years. He worked for me at Mattel, and uh, we were we were friendly. We played tennis together in the old days, and so here I came in, and I was kind of. Uh, aware that he had not had a good relationship with Sega of Japan, and they were disappointed in the progress that the company had made. Even though he'd only been there a short period of time, they were disappointed. And they were disappointed in his reaction to uh, to some of the software that they thought was, was good. And so, uh, you know, it, it was a difficult situation for me that I, I was going to have to to uh, get rid of Mike, and, and uh, we were buddies, and so that, that was kind of difficult and it took me a little while to do. But there were other people in the company that I also knew. I knew Paul Rio from Mattel, and he was a real good executive. I knew him well. Uh, we, again, had worked together for a long time at Mattel, and he was a great operations, a unusual combination of operations and finance and kind of general business. And Al Nielsen, I knew uh, well, and and had always admired his skill. Went back when he was a pennies buyer, hmm. and then he had come to work at Mattel. So, I, so, so there were people there that I knew and and uh, and trusted. Uh, a lot of work had to be done in building up the R and D area, in hiring people there, and of course adding to the marketing staff. So it wasn't so much a cleaning of the house, more than it was a building up on the on the on the foundation that had been put in place. And the momentum, once things really got cooking, was, was pretty stunning. Now, I was a Sega fan like back in the Master System days where you know, I, I believed wholeheartedly that it was the better, you know, the better hardware, and it was to a, to a large degree, but you know, the rest of the world didn't, didn't think it was. And I, I, felt, I told uh, Blake Harris the same thing. I felt kind of vindicated when uh, the Sega Genesis started picking up steam and really becoming a, a product that people sought. Um, were you surprised by, by how fast things happened after Sonic was released and, and you know, all the pieces that you had laid down as a foundation in a relatively short period of time started to come to fruition? Yeah, no, no I mean, when, of course, we did focus on Genesis completely in those days and, and frankly, uh, couldn't focus on Master System at the same time, even though a lot of people felt like you did, that it was a better system. But, you know, once I went to Japan and had the meeting there where I said, hey, guys, we've got to lower the price of the hardware. We're going to take Altered Beast out. We're going to put Sonic in. We're going to start doing lots of American uh, licenses and sports titles, and we're going to attack an older age group than Nintendo was targeting. And uh, uh, and we're going to take on Nintendo and make fun of them. And, of course, nobody agreed with any of that stuff, but, but they, that Nakayama, true to his word, said, well, you got promised you you can make the decisions for the U.S., so go ahead and do it. And we did that. Once he said, go ahead and do that, I was pretty confident that we were going to be able to build the company. Now, uh, your question, did I think it happened? It really happened faster than I thought possible, yes. But I, I was very confident we were going to be successful after that meeting. And I think, too, the marketplace was getting smarter. You know, one, one of the things that 
I, I was shocked about one day as a kid was walking into my the, the little newsstand at the, uh, the at the mall, the shopping mall, and uh, there was like a whole bunch of independent video game magazines that I'd never seen before because like Nintendo Power and and Sega Visions were the two you know the the company driven uh, uh, periodicals that had come out. And all of a sudden, there's magazines covering the industry I, I got so excited about it i started a cable tv show on my local cable access station to disseminate this information and the, I, I think the kids that you were selling to with these systems were a lot smarter at that point as consumers right well yes and again because they they were a little older than the the, 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 the toy child market they were interested in reading those those publications and learning about e- each each game um, reviews were very important to us. You know, you, you want to get good reviews from those, from those video game publications and from people like you who are commenting on them on, on, on cable. Right. So, so all that stuff, it, there was a concerted effort on our part to cater to the um, game magazines and to the game uh, publications and, and, and pundits who talked about games. I don't know if you're aware of this, but we basically had a paid college kid on almost every American campus that we gave free Genesis and lots of software to and, and other things and money and uh, wanted them to be the expert in the college community to, and talk up, say, to Genesis. And I, all of that helped, you know, it added to the, uh, the building of the brand. Yeah, and I, I was going to ask you about that because I, I read that part in the book and I said, you know, that's peer-to-peer marketing was not you know, the norm at that point, I mean, it's certainly become a lot more prevalent now. I mean, for me as a YouTube uh, product reviewer, I'm, I'm getting hit up constantly now. Um, and as my viewership grows, the brand, uh, the brand uh, caliber increases also for people that want me to try their product. And uh, was that a, a new thing, doing, doing those kind of college campus invasions and that sort of thing? Yeah, I think that was uh, a new thing. I mean, we did a lot. I think we did a lot of new things. That was one of them. Um, Al Nielsen had this great idea of, of doing uh, shopping mall uh, demonstrations where we compared Genesis and, and Sonic against Mario. I thought that was pretty brilliant, too. Uh, we had a big truck drive around full of, uh, full of machines and, and software that we put out in front of every rock concert that we could get to. So, again, targeting the, the teen and college market. Uh, we were the first to really do heavy sponsorship of MTV. I know that sounds crazy, but right. of course, back then, MTV really ran music videos. Yeah, they did. <laughs> <laughs> it was the real world and music videos. That was it. Yeah. And so they don't do that today. But anyway, yeah. and so we had a, a big effort in that area. Um, yeah, so lots of, I think, pretty revolutionary uh, grassroots marketing. Not necessarily, everybody thinks, oh, you, you had a great game in Sonic and you did great TV commercials. Well, there was more to it than that. Yeah, I think, I think there really was a lot of, you know, under, undercoding here that really built, you know, you built a critical mass of, of people actually seeing and touching the product. And that, I think that really helped lead to that. And you also, you know, on the earned media side, you know, you, you gave these reporters from these game magazines and other, uh, and other media outlets a little bit more uh, access. I mean, Nintendo really locked everything down to Nintendo Power. And uh, here you were, you know, just letting everyone see what you were up to. And I, I think that probably made a difference too, right? We were very friendly to them, and we invited them over. Uh, we we entertained them. Uh, you know, we had our at one point our 16 weeks of summer Genesis campaign, and uh, you know, all of these things I think helped uh, build build the brand. And that's what it was all about. It was let's build the Sega brand, and certainly Genesis, and certainly and certainly uh, Sonic as well. And then some of the other things that, frankly, I took from the toy industry. I, I did the, the uh, I shouldn't say I, because it was really a lot of people, <laughs> you know, besides, I, I always talk about just Al Nilsson and Paul Rio and, and Joe Miller and Shinobu Toyota, but there were a lot of others, you know, the Ellen Beth Van Buskirk and Diane Fornassier and Madeline Canapa Schroeder, all these people worked their tails off getting things done like a sonic television show. And, and people said, gee, you've got a television, you've got a network television show. Well, not only did we get a network television show, but we syndicated it and had a different show running five days a week after school. Right, just like and He-Man. So, <laughs> yeah, just like we did with He-Man <laughs> and Princess of Power. <laughs> but uh, so that, that was another effort. And then the Sonic comics and Sonic licensing. I'm, I'm, I don't remember who we did. We licensed to one of the shoe companies. It was the best shoe for a 
while. Right. So lots of stuff. And, and very clever putting him on shoes, given his uh, his, his speedy shoes in the game. So pretty pretty neat stuff. Uh, so it was evident, you know, as we talked about, that Japan kind of let you do your own, you know, guide the, the process to the American market as you saw um, fit. I'm sure they, they obviously wanted to be kept in the loop on, on occasion, but um, you had a gut feeling. This is one of the things that really struck me in the book was that, you know, at the height of, of the Genesis success, the market share is increasing. You, you're, you're getting a feeling like we got to do something uh, to continue this with a new piece of hardware. And, and, and you, you really started working on that, and Japan be, started to get a little uh, uh, confrontational at that point, right? Yeah, the, you're exactly right. I mean, it, you know, the, our head of R&D, Joe Miller, and I wanted to uh, get a really advanced next system out, and uh, Japan uh, kind of said to us, you know, your, your job is to do good software in the United States that appeals to the U.S. and Europe, and uh, we'll take care of hardware here. And, uh, you know, they really didn't like us getting involved in that. And that, that led to a couple of really bad decisions, I'm afraid. I mean, you know, I was very close to Sony and Olaf Olafsson and Mickey Shuloff back in those days who ran Sony. And uh, they were just learning how to do do games. You know, they had a little studio down in L.A. They really didn't know how to do games. But they're a powerful company. And so I thought, what the heck, they'd be a great partner. Let's define the specs for what we'd like to see in the next video game system together. And uh, we did that. And, we, and Sony wanted to do it. And we went to Sony Japan. And Sony Japan said, yeah, that's a great idea. And we go to Sega Japan, and Sega Japan, Ohio, and the other guys said, why would we want to do that? Why would we want to work with Sony? They don't know how to do video games. We'd be, you know, that's, that's, you know, we're better than they are. Why should we do that? And I thought this was crazy because, you know, we all lose money on hardware for at least the first three or four years, and you make your money on software. Well, well again, we were better at software and Sony was. So the deal was we'd split the loss on the hardware and whoever made the better software would benefit from the revenue and the profit. Well, clearly that was to our advantage. Right. It was and a... they disagreed. Wow. And then the next one was working with uh, Jim Clark, a uh, good friend over at uh, Silicon Graphics. And he had a brilliant, brilliant designer there who, who um, oh gosh, I'm going to forget the name, but uh, but he, anyway, uh, most of the chips that are in video game machines today are still made by this company. But anyway, not Silicon Graphics. This guy left and started another company. And, and uh, he had designed a chipset that, again, Joe Miller and I thought was really good for an advanced system. And we called Japan and had them come over, and they looked at it and said, no, 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 we do, we do a lot better work than this. And so um, that chip ended up being in the next Nintendo system. Right. So your two competitors uh, for the Saturn essentially um, were, were, could have been Sega systems uh, from, from the get-go, which uh, uh, it, must have, it must have driven you crazy to, to, to kind of, I mean, you really and, and it, it comes you know, from the book again that you really saw this coming and, and they instead put the Sega CD out there, they put the 32X out there. I think I bought my 32X for $19 at, at Toys R Us on closeout. <laughs> um, uh, how, how, how did you d deal with that with the staff? Because from what I was reading that you were clearly frustrated, you clearly expressed your, your, you know, your, your feelings to, to management in Japan, but you, you didn't really uh, express that to your staff, right? No, I tried to keep things uh, on, a, on an even keel. I mean, uh, I think some people knew how I felt. Shinobu knew how I felt and Paul knew how I felt. And, and, uh, Joe Miller certainly knew how I felt. And by the way, I mean, I should mention to you, I don't know, you know, Joe Miller was a great, great talent. And unfortunately, he passed away a few weeks ago at the age of 60. But, uh, yeah, he knew, he knew how I felt. And, uh, you know, we just tried to continue hoping that, that things would get, get better. But by the way, by, by 1995, I pretty much saw the writing on the wall and uh and the the kicker was when we were forced to, to to introduce Saturn with limited hardware and uh with uh h hardly any software and both Joe and I still thought it should be better than it was uh that was sort of the final straw mm. Yeah, because I remember walking into my electronics boutique you know we had been hearing about Saturn I I had a 3DO you know we were all 
bracing for impact with Sony's, you know, was like a hundred billion dollar marketing campaign or whatever they were going to unleash on, on everybody. And I remember walking into the store and like, wow, Saturn is out already. <laughs> Where did that come from? Um, so that must've been hard because you weren't prepared for that early of a launch, right? No, uh, no, we weren't prepared and we couldn't supply enough to make every retailer happy. And therefore we pissed off most of the retailers in America and we only had three software titles, which is not enough to have much impact in the market. Um, so it was, it was just, uh, it was one of these things that I, you know, I, I was forced to, to do, mm. uh, but I certainly didn't feel good about it. And at that point, I had pretty much uh, made up my mind I was going to have to go find something else to do. Yeah. Yeah, it must have been a tough, it must have been a tough period of time. And you, you talked about Sony. I mean, what, if you had your way, what would the roadmap have been? What, what would, where would you have gone with Sega next? Would you have done the Sega CD? You certainly wouldn't have done the 32X. Um, but what would you have done to, to you know, get as much life out of the Genesis as you could? And then, and then what would you have chosen for a next generation system? Yeah, we, we had the, the specs for the next hardware machine, which was going to be an optical disc machine, obviously. We all saw that that's what was coming. And by the way, that's why the Sega CD was done, was everybody had to learn how to program in this new format, uh, because we were all used to doing it in cartridges before, and there's this, there, at that time, uh, even, well, even today, there's, there's a significant difference in how you go about programming for those two different medium, uh, media. And so we all were learning on the, on the CD-ROM, so that kind of had to be done. And you know who our biggest partner on CD-ROM software was? It was Sony. Right, I remember that. It, and uh, we each uh, we each did uh, I think six titles each. We split the cost for doing them. Uh, it was it was difficult. You, you know you still had to have a bunch of memory in the hardware because really what was happening was you were downloading the game just a little bit ahead of where the player was right. from the CD. So anyway, I mean that was sort of a necessary step, but certainly the next platform for for Sega. Uh, I think if we had done what, what Joe and, and the engineers from Sony wanted to do, it would have been a better platform than the Saturn. And, and Sega would still be around today as a hardware manufacturer and probably in a great partnership with Sony. Yeah, and it would have, it would, I mean, Sony would have been foolish not to take that deal where their, where their risk was mitigated by 50%. You can't, you can't beat that <laughs> and, and still have access to a lot of uh, software revenue. I, I wanted to ask you about Nintendo, too, because they, they seem to never change their strategy. I mean, they've changed systems. I mean, things are changing and moving along the way. Um, they've been pretty stubborn in the market, and every time people write them off, they kind of just you know claw their way back out again. And to me, it seems like you know they're doing more creative work now than than the other big players in the industry. Where you know S Sony and Microsoft have you know, have their next generation systems. They're they're focused you know primarily on these these big budget shoot 'em up games that um, I I just don't see a lot of creativity in. They seem to be kind of uh, staying the course. What, what do you think about what they've done? Because they don't—they were a Japanese managed company. They really didn't change, even when when you guys were were you know killing them in the marketplace. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on them in, in this in this current environment? Yeah, it, well, you know, it's a funny thing. I mean, I actually behind the scenes, I always kind of admired them for their stick to itiveness, even when we were competing with them and beating them and uh, in the market. And I of course enjoyed that greatly. But I, I agree with a lot of what you've said. I mean, they've, they've proven that their strategy of really focusing on making great games really pays off. Uh, you know, they, they are very, very careful about it. I thought the Wii was a terrific invention. Uh, got a lot of new people that had never played video games before involved in, in video games. And, of course, now the other competitors uh, have a, a similar type of uh, ability. Uh, their hardware has a, that same ability to play with motion, motion uh, uh, sensor type of, of games. Um, and I thought their, uh, the efforts that they made in handheld to keep it going for as long as they have were, were admirable. I mean, my God, they got the Game Boy going forever, and then right. they bring the DS out, and and for a while, they were quite successful with that. So, you know, I, I wouldn't write Nintendo off. I mean, you, I keep waiting. What are they going to do next? And, of course, one of the things they're doing next is they, they are copying a little bit of uh, what Activision is doing. They've got their, their, I forgot the name of it, their attachment to, 
to their hardware where you can take figures and put them on and they enter into the game. Right, and yeah, yeah. it's kind of a kind of a neat little way of uh, adding to the play pattern. Yeah, and, it, and it's something that you can't just uh, download off of. You know, it keeps the retailers happy because you have to go and buy it somewhere <laughs> versus uh, uh, downloading it off uh, their store directly. So uh, before we close out, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about educational technology because I know that's a passion of yours. That's what you're doing now. Um, I, I'm a father now, so I'm, I'm very invested in uh, finding the best uh, ways for my daughter to learn things. And one of the things that struck me about where we're at right now, and, and I'm on my local board of education also, um, is the efficiency in learning that this technology is bringing us. I mean, we're at a point when, when I was in school, we had Apple IIs, and we're kind of like a, you know, an accessory item. Uh, now, you know, we've seen just amazing strides here to, to imp- improve the speed in which people can learn. Uh, what are you seeing out there that's, that's really um, exciting to you now in, in the educational world? Great question. Well, and of course, the, one of the reasons I, that I was so uh, pleased to get an offer to join what became Knowledge Universe was I saw an opportunity to really use video game technology for making education more fun and interesting for not just children, but but for all ages. And the thing that I like best about what we're able to do, and I'm I'm still very involved with LeapFrog, and I'm on the board of Cambium Learning Group, and people talk about the gamification of education, and sometimes they deride that a little bit. But to me, it's a wonderful thing if we can make every subject so much more interesting and yes, maybe even fun, so that kids or college-age students or even adults are enjoying learning as opposed to it being a somewhat painful process, isn't that all better? And then the other thing I like is the personalization that we're able to do right now. In a very short period of time, we can find, figure out where every child or, or again, teen or college-age or adult is in a particular area or subject, and we can personalize the content so that we just keep stretching them a little bit. We don't dumb it down so much that they're bored with it, and we don't make it so advanced that they want to give up. We can keep it right at their zone of, of best uh, ability to learn. And I think that's a wonderful thing to do. And then the other thing is that we can track everything. And so we can ha- gather all this data so we know which kids are ahead, which kids are behind in work subjects, and we can help them easier and faster than ever before. And then the final thing is, we, as a parent, and I'm certainly a parent, you're a parent, we can make all this information available to parents so that they can be in, very involved in the education process as opposed to just sending the kids to school and getting a report card every six months. They can see what's going on every week yes. and where their child is. It's Every shocking. Day. Yeah, it's and amazing. It, it's it's been that's a terrific thing. It so is all it, of those have me excited. Yeah, and it's <laughs> it's but it's been most exciting to me is is as a board member also that you know we we have a, so much of a better picture about you know where our budgetary investments are paying off. You know because we're not only looking at how this this class year is doing. We're, we we had a presentation two weeks ago where every kid kids progress each individual kids progress was made in in that whole grade level yeah. and it's just um and 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 some of the technology and helping them uh find you know the, those little things that get them off track uh addressing them immediately because that you know it's because of that personalization and it's just um it's just such, a, such an exciting time and I'm, I'm glad my my daughter's only 15 months so she's got <laughs> she's got a lot of exciting uh uh, stuff ahead of her. So, uh, so you're going to be um, in a movie, a documentary, I would assume, right? The, uh, the the documentary on the book Console Wars that's coming out soon, right? Yes, uh, but the documentary's been shot and it's in final editing, so they'll get it out around the end of the year, maybe even at Sundance uh, Film Festival, and then the feature film is is still being written. And that that's exciting. So you're gonna you're gonna have some some actor play you, um, and I'm sure you've been asked which one you think it'll be. But um, I won't ask that because I'm sure everybody's asked you that. But uh, you know you're you're about to become like a you know a household name here with with this. Did you ever in a million years when you took that job on the on the beach in Maui essentially um, think that that you would become the subject of a feature film? Uh, no, that never occurred to me, and I still uh, you know I still wonder is this really going to happen or not. So I'm, I'm really pleased with the book, Console Wars. I'm really pleased. So I've seen uh, much of the documentary. I'm really pleased with it. And we'll just keep our, our fingers crossed and see if the uh, feature film actually happens. Great. Well, Tom, thank you so much for, uh, for joining me. I really appreciate it. Our, our viewers are, uh, 
are at least the ones of my age are huge Sega Genesis fans, and and uh, it, it was uh, really really fun to talk to you about uh, about your experiences there, and uh, we'll we'll keep an eye on things and looking forward to seeing the documentary. Well, great. Well, thanks very much. I really enjoyed chatting with you as well. 